Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all, especially my brother Gary Mason. So I said good morning, he said good morning back. He was, gets special mention because he talked back. Unlike school, where you get in trouble if you talk back. This is the last week of August. Where did summer go? It's gone, poof, just like that. Any of you have your bulletins with you? Yes. Just to bring a couple of things to your attention. Number one, there's a coffee house this evening. And so if you guys are uh, interested in coming and having fellowship and listening to music and glorifying the Lord in that way, if you don't have a ton of other things going on, on a Sunday night, right. By all means, come on out. We'd love to have you out here. And we've got, uh, we have a 25th anniversary of Grace Bible Fellowship coming up. Believe it or not, this church has existed for 25 years uh, b before me, because I was still very young. <laughs> but we're going to have a whole bunch of people, pastors that have been part of the church and other people to come. And so if you guys get signed up, you should be able to find the sign up sheet and uh, the information that you need is found in your bulletin. So you can save the date. What a nice picture of our church that is. Yes, it is. <clears throat> Blue skies. It's amazing what a little technical adjustment can do. <laughs> Praise God. And I don't know if I have anything else. I think that's it. Off the top of my head. It's coming. I've embedded it into my message. So. Yes, and the men's retreat is coming up. So. If man building. Ladies, sorry you're not invited. Wouldn't it be nice to know how to build a man? But as the scripture says, you can't make a man without a woman. And behind every good man is a good woman poking him. So we're going to be talking about how God builds a man, the characteristics that God has that he breeds into our life through various characters in the Bible. So we're going to talk about... People like Abraham, when you have to be obedient and you don't know where you're going. When you're like David and you're the least and the lowest and you don't have high expectations for your life and God does something miraculous and how to step up to that. People like Job who go through suffering and don't know why, can't seem to find a fault of their own and are just trying to make sense out of suffering when there seems to be no purpose. So we'll be talking about all of these characters and all of the characteristics that God breeds into our lives through challenge and difficulty. Um, so uh, I would encourage you men to come. Um, it, it's not quite as easy as this, um, but you won't end up looking like this. <laughs> It's usually through the most difficult situations that God makes our character. And if, uh, if Michelangelo's David says anything to you, it was once just a hunk of marble. And now it's, it's a work of art. And God very often has to chisel things off of us to reveal his character in us and to create his character in us. And it's usually through hardship and trial and testing of our faith. And so we're going to talk about that as men, very frankly and very honestly. So I would encourage you to come. Previously, we've been trying to go through First Peter chapter 1. Um, this will be the second week I'm trying to get through it. So my apologies to you that I'm not as succinct or that I go on and blather on endlessly. You know that he's writing this letter to those who are in Turkey, modern-day Turkey. So if you were wondering where all of the places are that he's titled it to, that's where it is. And uh, you can see it up here on the screen. As he's writing to them, he's telling them he's an apostle. He just flat out introduces himself as an apostle. He doesn't do some of the more literate and, uh, in, in, um, uh, passive aggressive things that Peter does to in, invoke his name on people. But he just tells this is, yeah, I'm Peter. I'm the guy you heard about the guy who messed up and denied the Lord three times. And it's, uh, 
He tells, he calls them elect according to the foreknowledge of God and the sanctification of the spirit for the obedience of the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. All this meaning is God foreknew you and picked you and chose you, which I don't understand. And I don't know why. Do you? But I know that without him causing us to look for him, that we would, we would want nothing to do with him. We'd want to just live according to the flesh. I mean, who in the world wants to get up early and go to church on a Sunday and read an ancient text? Who in the world wants to do that? But, but see, with the Holy Spirit of God inside of us, it's something that adds to our life. It feeds the fire of our souls. And we become a different person because Christ comes into our life. And so because of that, um, he gives us all sorts of exhortations. We went on last week. He says grace to them and gives them an introduction. And he talks about this inheritance that we have in Christ Jesus, which is kept in heaven for us. Not like your car keys or your cell phone that you might lose, but it's kept in heaven for you. This inheritance, which is imperishable. It's not like your 401k, which could be here today and gone tomorrow or like social security which was supposedly bankrupt years ago. So it's not like those things. This is an inheritance which is guaranteed and backed by God, which is better than gold. Amen? Amen. So we, we talked about that and about how we are kept by the power of God. And I am so glad for that because um, like my car keys and cell phone, I might misplace my salvation or throw it away. He says, in this you greatly rejoice, though for a little while you may have been grieved by various trials. He tells us there's a purpose to it, that the, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So there's a purpose in trials. Now, they were going through some heavy persecution. Rome at this point was under Nero. Nero. Uh, set a fire in, in Rome and burned down much of Rome because he wanted to build something new. And uh, all the people that were squatting in their homes were making it trouble. And then he just decided to blame the Christians. And so at that point, he evacuated all the Christians and many of the Jews out of Rome because he saw them as troublemakers. He used it as an example of, uh, of clearing out troublemakers when it was he himself who set the fire. And there's uh, historical, uh, you know, documentation on that. He didn't fiddle. That's, a, that's not true. But you guys probably heard that Nero fiddled while Rome burned. Did, had you, did you sing the song? <laughs> <laughs> so God tells us that there is a reason for suffering and difficulty because it proves our faith like gold that goes through fire. When it goes through fire, gold won't burn. It melts down and you can see the clarity of it. And if there's anything that comes up out of it, the slag, the contaminants, it kind of floats to the top and you scrape that stuff off and you end up with 24 karat gold, which is what God does with us. Amen. Amen. He allows us to go through difficult times, hard times that stress us and cause us to say, God, help me. And he goes, I thought you'd never ask. And this salvation that the prophets spoke of in the past didn't understand what they had written. It's interesting. I don't know what it was like for them to be inspired by the Holy Spirit to write the things, and they wrote them down, and they went, hmm, wonder what that means. I mean, this isn't early onset Alzheimer's. This is spirit-led writing. That's the scriptures. They're inspired by God through human instruments, uh, much like you would be the person writing something and you might use a pen or using a computer. These men, like Peter, were basically computers and pens. And it was inspired by God. Well, those people in the Old Testament, the prophets who prophesied of the blessings that would come, didn't even understand all of what it was they were writing. Can you imagine the frustration? Writing things that are yet to happen and how God's going to roll out his grace and his Holy Spirit to his church and not know what it was that you were writing, being so inspired by the Spirit. That's the kind of possession I like. I want to be possessed like that. How about you? Amen. Not by an evil spirit, but by the Spirit of God. And so he says there are things that angels want to look into. So there's this angelic curiosity that they want to know what it is that's going on. And the angels want to know. So I, th I find that interesting. So the salvation that you and I have is 
something that angels long to look into. And I wonder how often we just take it for granted. You know, that Jesus has given us the ball and we're running with it and we don't understand how precious it is what we have. So we're going to go back into 1 Peter. We're going to pick it up from verse 13. Verse 13, continuing on, says, Therefore, in other words, because of all the things that were said previously, that's why I said them. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Did you know your mind has loins? It's not just a cut of meat, you know. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to former lusts, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, so also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy." How many of you are intimidated? Four, five. Be holy. And whenever I see that word, I always put a, naturally, I put a W in front of it. Be holy, because to be holy means you're totally and completely given over to God's purposes. You know, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and use me essentially. So when I think of holiness, the set apart, the sacredness of what God set us apart for, I think about being completely and totally given over to the Lord. So if that helps you to think about that, because when you think about holy, you think about perfect and nobody's perfect and especially me. And so I'm a dirty dog and I can't do this thing the scripture's asking me to do. Any of you go through that little recitation in your mind? I can tell you, you can do what God tells you you can do. If he says, if you have faith of a mustard seed, you could tell that mountain move and it will, then it will. If God says it, I believe it, that settles it. That makes it simple, right? Bumper sticker worthy. <laughs> Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. So because of all these things that God has done, what's our response? Well, we gird up the loins of our mind. Well, I don't know if any of you ever girded up your loins, but let me give you a quick diagram. Yes. <laughs> Typically, human beings, typically human beings of this time would have very long clothing. And what they would do is they would reach down, grab their robe, if you will, and it would go between the legs and would go around the back and it would come around the front and you'd tie it up. And in so doing, you would tie up the loins of your clothing. Okay. Now, if you look up loins, I did, you look up loins it's, it's the place where procreation happens. <laughs> Took you a minute. Okay. Yeah, when it says that David would come from the loins of Abraham, then you understand this. Okay? But the, the Hebrews, the ancient Hebrews actually believed it was the hips or between the hips. You don't care about this stuff. But I thought it was interesting. So how does one gird up the loins of their mind? You see, when you, when you do that and you tie off all that extra material, you'll be able to run. You'll be able to fight. You'll be able to work. It's about getting serious. So when he says gird up the loins of your mind, that means prepare your mind for action. That's, that, you know, that's like a clear thing. I can do that. Jesus says... Okay, I'm ready. I'm tucking my shirt in, I'm tightening my belt, make sure my shoes are tied, I'm ready. Whatever's going to happen. And Peter's telling us to gird up the loins of our mind. You know, the Bible talks a lot about the mind. You know that? Long before psychology and Freud and B.F. Skinner and Carl Jung and all these guys, there was Jesus and the apostles. Gird up the loins of your mind so that you'll be ready to jump into action. In Luke 12, 35 to 38, Jesus says, let your waist be girded. By the way, that's where we get the word girdle. Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning and you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding, and when he comes, he, knock, he knocks that they may open to him immediately. 
Jesus is telling us the same thing. Be ready. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down and eat, and he will come and serve them. Can you imagine that? And if he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so blessed are those servants. Jesus says that we should be ready for his return. And there's a way that we do it. And we gird up the loins of our mind, if you will. And we keep our lamps burning. We know Jesus talks a lot about you being the light of the world. And you don't put that light under a bushel, right? You put it on a lampstand so it gives light to everyone. You don't put it under a bed, uh, that would be a house fire. That would not be a good idea. <laughs> so let your light so shine among men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father who's in heaven. So we have this wonderful treasure that God gives to us in having a relationship with him. And he says that we should live it out fully and gird up the loins of our mind and make this stuff happen. You guys get what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay, because I'm moving on now. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 8. Paul writing to the, to the church in Philippi saying, Let nothing be done through selfish ambitious or ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Notice the state of mind. Let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, that, that would be a slave, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even to death on the cross. Have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who stepped down and became like us and died for sins he never committed. That's what Jesus calls us to do. And if he calls us to do it, he gives us the strength to do it. Amen. Amen. So I can think of you as more important than me, which is why I'm not parked out here in the parking lot. <laughs> There are practical, small little ways that we can prefer other people as more important than us when we take a lesser place instead of, you know, hey, I deserve this. Carl keeps threatening he's going to give me a parking spot with my name on it. <laughs> and I keep telling him, don't do that. I'll never park there. And probably no one else will. Oh, that's Pastor Dave's place. <laughs> I'm, I'm around the block. I'm over there out of your way. So when you guys come flying in here late, you got a place to go. <laughs> and it's just a, that's a small thing. You know, there are ways that we can think of others as more important than ourselves. You get a phone call and you pick up the phone. Did you know there's a Christian way to answer a phone? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Not like that. Who is this? What do you want? Telemarketer? I figured. <laughs> what is it the other person wants when they call you? They want to know they got you, right? And they want to know that you're available to maybe help them, right? Amen. If you're thinking about their needs. When I was in business, I used to pick up the phone and say, Hi, this is Dave. How can I help you? Oh, a kind voice who wants to help me. How, how different is that? You want to stand out and you want to be the light of the world, there are so many little ways that you can do it. If you're thoughtful and prayerful, the Spirit of God will give you ideas on how you can prefer other people. I have people that leave notes for me. Good ones, not bad ones. <laughs> they give me little notes. Sometimes after church, people will send me a text, Pastor Dave, I really appreciate what you said. And it's like, they didn't just say, oh, thank God church is over. I'm going home to eat. <laughs> they took a moment to send me a text. And I bet you guys could do that too. Not, not to me, but I mean to one another. <laughs> Have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who did not think equality with God was something to be grasped and held on to. But he made himself of no reputation. He made himself, emptied himself. And he came, took on the form of a man. And being found in the form of a servant, he humbled himself, even to death and death on the cross. 
we can do this. Imagine what that would look like. It's like a giant table where no one has elbows. And there's lots of food on the table. But no one's gone hungry because everyone feeds one another. And you don't have to bend your elbow to feed the person next to you. Right? Hell is a place with a big long table and lots of food and no elbows. And everyone's trying to get food in their face and they're just covered in it and they get nothing in their mouth. That's the world. That's narcissism. Well, I don't want to bring up big words. Okay. <laughs> Be holy because I am holy, the Lord says. In Philippians 4, 8, another thing about our minds. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, and it's hard to do with our news cycle these days, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, that means worthy of love, whatever things are of good report, you know, the opposite of gossip. If there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things or think on these things. The word for meditate actually means to chew. One of the words for meditate means to chew. That means like a cow that goes out into the field that jams his face full of grass and things and puts it down in his stomach. When he gets back, what he does is he actually regurgitates this and chews it up into a finer mulch where he's in a place of protection and he's comfortable. And then it goes down into another stomach. It's good to have a spare stomach. <laughs> Especially on the all-you-can-eat days. But that's what a cow does, and that's what we're supposed to do, is take in the Word of God. And I would hope that you guys are taking this, because this isn't my opinion or my, the my theology. This is the Bible. And that you take it home and chew it up and say, I want to meditate on these things. Can I think of anything that's noble or anything that's praiseworthy? Can I think about things? What, what's true? What do I know is true? Because, you know, sometimes we feed ourselves lies. The enemy does that. He'll seed lies in our head. You guys get that? Well, I hope you do, because that means you're in a battle. If you're not in a battle, then that's a problem. So, yeah, it, it should be a common experience because we all have that spiritual life. But these are things that we're to set our mind on and think about. Colossians 3, 2 to 7 says, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. It's not that you're not supposed to know about Kamala Harris and Biden and Trump and, you know, all of these. It's not that you're not to know about these things, but don't set your mind on it because it will drive you nuts. If you, if you put CNN on and have a steady diet of CNN on your TV all day, you'll be a maniac by the end of the day. Why would, you, why would you do that to yourself? So set your mind on things above. Because, by the way, eternity is much longer than how we're going to live on this earth. Amen. It's very short. Set your mind on things above, not on things in the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members, which are on the earth. By the way, that's your body that tells you you want to do stuff, like slap somebody or say something unkind or uh, cut somebody off or, or whatever your propensity is. So you put to death those things, your members on the earth, fornication, I won't explain. Un uncleanness, which is short of fornication, but it's, it's a sexual contamination. Passion. Be careful of passion, right? When you feel something deeply, because you can go off the deep end pretty quickly, right? Do you know how passion can mess you up? I've got a job. I work with a guy. He never does what he's supposed to do. <laughs> One day I'll get him careful. That's not a good motor to be uh, idling in your heart, right? Because you're going to throw it and drive. It'll just take one more episode. And boy, I can tell you, I've been there. Passion. Be careful of feeling too much. You know, somebody might say a word and trigger you and you go, <gasps> you know, that's not a good thing. 
The fact that you have landmines that people inadvertently step on, buttons that somebody accidentally pushes when they say a word, that's not good. And it's not their fault, it's yours. You shouldn't have those buttons, right? Amen. Somebody walks up to me and said, Dave? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And somebody says, yeah, that's Pastor Dave. And they, I, I, I thought he was a drug addict. <laughs> you know, I used to be a drug addict, but I'm not. And they could say that word drug addict a million times, it won't bother me. Because it's not who I am, it's who I was. And so it's not a button that anybody's going to push. Now, if somebody said, I'm fat, <laughs> in humility, I got to agree with you. And of course, I want to run to my own defense and say, well, I'm not as fat as I once was. <laughs> but it gives me a little comfort. So what I'll say is, you're right. Thank you. Pray for me. Keep me out of the fellowship hall. Sorry, I, I, I could just go off. Forgive me. Set your minds on things above, not on things of the earth. When Christ appears, then our life will appear. Therefore, put to death the members that are on the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire. That means bitterness, anger, unforgiveness. And covetousness, which is idolatry. Did you know covetousness is idolatry? Oh, man, did you see the new iPhone? Oh, it's so sweet. I wish I had one of those. That's called sin. Boy, I've seen some of your cars. You got some nice cars in that parking lot. I got to tell you, looking a whole lot better than my 2013 Mini. <laughs> Forgive me, Lord. Because when you're covetous, you're telling God he's not doing a good job taking care of you. When you're covetous, you're telling God that you don't like the way he's taking care of you. That's why it's idolatry, because you're worshiping stuff over God. Maybe that's helpful. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. In other words, for this list, and he gives another list, and he says, so now that you guys have this, by the way, there's a whole bunch of other things you're supposed to rid yourself of, and anger is one of them, because the anger of man doesn't work the righteousness of God. These are things in which we once walked in our ignorance, but now we know better, don't we? Our soul is empty because we as a people are sinners against God, and we seek to fill that empty spot with everything this world has to offer, and it never satisfies only the Lord Jesus Christ does because it's a God-shaped hole that we have and only an eternal God can fill an eternal hole. And yet sometimes we go for the cheap substitute and think it's going to satisfy and it never does. Never does. In Romans twelve sixteen it says, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things. In other words, have high expectations for yourself, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. So, it says to associate with the humble, the lowly, the poor, the, the disenfranchised, the dejected, those who are on the fringes of society. It says those are the people we should stoop to Amen. and not be thinking so highly of ourselves that we're above, you know, well, who are you? Well, I don't know who you are. You look down your nose at people. I mean, I hate when people do that. And it doesn't matter if they're, you know, what their sex or their orientation is or their, um, their income level. None of those things should matter because God loves them and sent his son to die for them. And so why wouldn't I love them since God loved them way more than I could ever love them with a perfect love? We should love all people. And it's in the Bible, people. You don't need to be woke to do any of that bananas. Do what the Bible tells you to do. Read it and believe it and do it. And guess what? We won't have the mess we're in. In fact, the more you talk about it, the worse it gets. Don't set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. And do not be wise in your own opinion. <clears throat> because we don't belong to ourselves, people. Right? Right? I'm talking to you if you're a Christian. You're not a Christian, don't worry. You belong to yourself. Live like hell because that's all you have. But if you're a Christian and you say you put your faith in Jesus Christ, then you don't belong to yourself. 
You belong to the Lord. He bought and paid for you Amen. completely. Past, present, and future. I'm his. You're his. And if that's the case, I need to remember, okay, Lord, I need to be like an obedient child, like the scripture says, and do what you've called me to do. And it's funny because that's what brings us joy. When you consider other people more important than yourself, you don't just consider your own needs, you consider the needs of others. When you do that, there is a joy that happens inside of you. Christmas, my wife's favorite time, because she gets to buy gifts all year for people <laughs> and sock them away and then give them to them. And she's one of those very deep, thoughtful givers. She will look and notice what you need and... What are you writing there? Nothing, nothing. <laughs> She's a tricky giver. You know, she discovers things that, you know, you don't even know you need, but you need. And then you have them and you're, you're blessed. But because we belong to him, the things that we do bring joy because the spirit of God, the spirit of God that lives within us. Remember, we belong to him. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body, because God resides here. You know, God doesn't, God may meet us here in a special way in the church, but you are the church. God lives in you. You are his temple. That's where all the worship is done. That's where all the connection is. That's where you're going to hear messages from the Holy Spirit is in us. So take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. So this is uh, Paul giving an admonition to the elders, and he says, feed the flock of God of whom Christ purchased with his own blood. And so when I think I could, well, I, I could do something for myself, couldn't I? You really don't belong to yourself, so you really should check with the Lord, right? Yeah, you should, if you're wondering. You should. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. So we're to have this. And if you call in the father who without partiality, now you guys, you guys might think partiality is a, a strange thing because, you know, by the way, there's, there's, you're not going to be able to hang out with everyone evenly, are you? In fact, I don't think you should spend time with everyone evenly, right? Or you'll get nothing done. But you choose people to spend time with, don't you? Aren't you partial? <gasps> Is that what it means? You know, there are some people that think that. We need to have equity of outcome. We need to everyone alike. And Well, that's going to be a real problem because I'll be out of a job and we'll have anybody come up here. <laughs> and we'll have people in the NBA who can't play basketball. And, we'll, you know, we'll have all kinds of problems. No, we, we choose to hang out with certain people. I, I married one woman. I forsake, forsook all the others. That sounds very partial, right? Mm -hmm. I go to this church. I don't go to any other church. That seems very partial, right? Mm -hmm. And yet that's not what it means. The word partiality is up here. It's, you pronounce it yourself. Partiality is favoritism or respecting certain people over another, like a rich person goes to court and they get off and it's okay. Poor people, they're going to jail forever. It's that kind of partiality. You guys might know it as judgment. You know, in chapter 7 of Matthew, when Jesus says, do not judge, and we go, oh, wow, okay. Well, we have judges that sit in, in seats and they make renderings and we have lawyers. And so is that what it means? It's very confusing. This is what it is to judge. It's to look in favor on one by appearance or because you already have some prejudgment done as you are dealing with them. In fact, Jesus says it in here, chapter 7 of Matthew, judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. 
That makes sense. If you're going to judge, make sure you're judging in accordance with the way you want somebody to judge you, because it's coming back. You know, it, 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 it's like playing racquetball up on a wall. It's going to come back to you. So however it is that you treat other people, it's going to come back to you. So be careful the way that you treat other people. You know, if you're going to be rude to them, know it's going to come back to you. Because what judgment you judge, it'll be judged back to you. In the same measure you use, it'll be measured back to you. Have you ever had to eat your own words? Oh, horrible, terrible taste. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but you do not consider the plank in your own eye? You see, that's somebody that has a judgmental spirit. Or how can you say to your brother, here, let me remove the speck from your eye. And look, there's a plank in your own eye. Hypocrite. Jesus is being very easy on these people. First, remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. You see, Jesus recognizes that there are people who walk around with internal guilt, and the way that they deal with it is they point at everyone else that has the same problem as them and condemn them when they themselves don't do what they need to do. It'd be like me criticizing fat people. You know, there are fat people in this world. I mean, why can't they just get a control of themselves? You know, you should poke me like the Pillsbury Doughboy and say, yeah, that's good advice. I wonder if you're listening to yourself, right? Be careful what comes out of your face because it comes from a place, it could be guilt. And what it does is it translates into judgment on other people. And so make sure you've got your own act together before you start pointing the finger or you think you're going to help someone. Hey, you got a speck in your eye and you got a log hanging out of yours. That doctor is not qualified. All right, smoking a cigarette. Yeah, I'm about to open you up. You gonna you gonna put that out? Nah, it's all right. It's just ashes. <laughs> okay, count to ten. No, no, I don't want you opening me up. Nicotine fingers, and he's gonna open me up. No, 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 no. It's like that when people come up to you and start telling you, you know what you should do. And, it's, and you wonder, if, are you listening to your advice? Because it would be really good if you had been doing it, you know. <laughs> First, remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now listen to this, verse 6. Do not give what is holy to dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. The picture is... Giving pearls, that which is precious, that which is delicate, that which is attractive to a pig who can't appreciate it, or a dog who would probably rather gnaw on your neck, which means you have to make a judgment that somebody's a dog or a pig. Don't try to jam the gospel down the mouth of somebody who wants nothing to do with it. Just say nothing. Share as much as you can. It's like trying to feed somebody who's not hungry. You're hungry. Let me make something. No, no, no. I'm good. I'm good. No, no, no. Let me get some leftovers out here. You know, that's, you got to eat. No, no, no. I just ate. I'm completely full. I couldn't eat another bite. Oh, of course you can. No problem. We'll do this. And yet there are people that do that with the gospel. And they try to tell them things that they can't, they won't even open their mouth to try to digest. So don't waste your time, because sometimes we end up having motives of our own to do that. You know, we're trying to put a notch in our belt. I like, got another one, you know, or whatever. God help me. You know, I'm so twisted, and I have a feeling you're twisted like me. So that's why I don't mind sharing with you the things that go through my head. Be careful that you don't give what is holy to dogs. You don't cast pearls before swine, because all they're going to want to do is just tear after you, because they're animals. Matthew twenty two sixteen says, And they sent to him their disciples, the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you're true and that you teach the way of God in truth, nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. On first read, that seems very unusual. They were giving him a compliment, and they said, Listen, we know that you don't show favoritism. 
We know that you don't have a prejudice against people because you're eating with tax collectors and sinners and you're hanging around with prostitutes and they're getting converted. And, you know, we realize that you don't give a rip what anybody thinks about you. That would be my editorial Jersey version on it. You don't really care what people think about you when you speak. No, no, I really don't. And, and then they asked him a difficult question. So should we pay taxes to Caesar? So they were, they were setting a net for his feet, actually. But Jesus didn't prejudice himself, and he was doing the very things that we're admonished to do in the scriptures, which is to associate with the lowly and show love towards people that would otherwise not be loved. And the church is a very attractive place for things like that. James chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. Now, brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Lord of glory with partiality. Now you understand what that means. For there, if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come a poor man, filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you, sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, you stand there. Or here, sit at my feet by my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? You see, you think that the, that the poor person is evil because God would have certainly blessed them, right? And the rich person must be blessed by God because they're a good, moral, upstanding person. Well, you walk into Congress and that's not the case. <laughs> Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom in which he promised to those who love him? Isn't it the poor that will hear the gospel before the rich? Amen. Hey, can I tell you about Jesus? Oh, no, I know all about him. I grew up in church and I went through all these things. And, you know, I, I you know, uh, Saturday Patri, should have bought a Honda. You know, I, I know all that stuff. I, I grew up with that. I got no use for any of that hypocrisy. You know, there are people that are like that. You may have been a people like that. But thank God he breaks through to show us the truth of the scriptures unveiled by human contamination. And we know who Jesus is. And it's a good thing. So we don't show favoritism towards people because God didn't. In fact, it's the people that have needs that will listen. It's the drug addicted. It's somebody who, who hates themselves because they don't know what life is all about. It's those people that will hear about Jesus Christ gladly. The common people accepted Jesus gladly. It was the Pharisees, the Sadducees. It was all of them who gave him such trouble because they thought they knew more than he did. And they weren't willing to be humble and listen to what Jesus said, except for a few, like Nicodemus or Joseph of Arimathea. But it's few. So if you call on the Father who, without partiality, judges according to each one's work, you know that God's not going to show special favor, right? What's the difference between a person that lives a relatively good life and somebody that leads a really horrible, decadent, self-centered you know, megalomaniac life. You know, they're both in sin before God. God's not going to favor one over the other. I think there are degrees of punishment in hell as there are degrees of reward in heaven, but you're still not going to make it. You know, you're not going to be in some netherworld and somebody's going to pay off your sin and then get you to heaven afterwards because it's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. And we stand before God and have to give an account of our lives and what we've done. And God's not going to show any special favor for any other reason other than Jesus Christ. Amen. If we're in Jesus Christ, that's it. In Acts 10, 34, Peter opened his mouth and he said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. He told this to Cornelius and his household, the first Gentiles to ever come to know the Jewish Messiah, Jesus Christ. And he says, you know what? I, God had to give me a, a, a sheet lowered from heaven three times. But I finally got it. God shows no partiality. But he seeks us out. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. In Romans 2.11, it says, for there's no partiality with God. Just in case you needed some more scriptures for me to prove my point. Ephesians 6, 9, and you masters do the same things to them. Speaking of those who are uh, under your care, uh, like an employer, employee, give it, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven and there's no partiality with him. 
He's exhorting Christians who have slaves at that time not to treat them harshly and to give up manipulation and yelling and coercion and all those things you learn when you're a parent and you have children that don't behave. No quick confessions here, okay. When you have kids that don't listen to you, it's like, what do I have to do? You know, you want to put them in a straitjacket. Don't touch that. <laughs> you, what do you do? What do you do when you have a kid that doesn't listen? You pull your hair out, go on medication. There's a lot of really bad things you could do, you know, that just don't help the situation at all. Or you could teach them to love God. You could teach them to reach out to the Lord. That's the best thing, because then they autocorrect, because the Spirit of God's in their lives. And man, that's a blessing when your kids come to Christ, I can tell you. Amen. Give up threatening, knowing that your own master who's in heaven and there will be no partiality with him. And so the way that you treat other people, like I said, it comes back on you, right? It says that we should forgive others in the way we wish to be forgiven, right? It's right in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors or those who have sinned against us. Oh, no. <laughs> God, I want you to forgive me according to your loving kindness, okay? <laughs> Don't take me as your example of love and forgiveness. And yet, that's what Jesus said you should pray. I wonder if that was supposed to do something to us when we pray it. Father, forgive me the way I forgive ev Well, except for that person. I wouldn't want you to treat me like that. Hmm, maybe I should let that go. And it's funny how those things tend to creep in, you know, like so many leftovers in your fridge going bad. It just seems to appear, and then there's this awful fragrance in your life. And it can be bitterness that gets into your life. Got to clean, got to clean the fridge out, because there's no partiality with God, and he sees it. In Colossians 3.25, but he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. So all throughout the scriptures, there's this about God that he doesn't, he doesn't have a curve that he grades on. It's right or it's wrong. It's good or it's evil, and he stands on it. It's not like our lawmakers, which, you know, change, you know, with every, you know, election cycle. God is faithful, and he's faithful to do what he said he's going to do. And so we should live this life in this awesome reverence, in this, I better be really careful, this is serious stuff sort of mentality, right? Because it's, it's not a joke. You know, I used to go through my life like it was a joke and I would hurt people casually and I wouldn't give a rip. What are you going to do to me? Take away my birthday? You know. And it says, but you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold and from your aimless conduct. Now, this is largely a church uh, full of uh, Gentiles, by the way. And so he's talking about something a little differently than he's talking about when he talks to the Jews. You know, you used to be able to go to a slave market and buy a slave. They would bring them all out, and you, you would find one that you wanted, and you'd find out the price, and you'd pay the price, and you'd take them home. And so that person was redeemed from the slave market by you, and you took them home, and hopefully you treated them really well, like in addition to your family maybe and they become a bondservant. But he says, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from the aimless conduct received by tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. You see, God paid a huge payment for you. You know, sometimes you don't feel like you're worth it, but then if you look at Jesus... And think of what he sacrificed. And if you were the only one on the face of the planet, he would have had to do it for you. And he would have. And that's an amazing thing. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Who, through him, believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Need I remind you who's writing this book? Peter. Peter. He's attesting that Jesus rose from the dead. He saw him with his own eyes. 
And he's preaching this not from, I learned this thing, but I know this thing. In fact, he gave his life uh, with this testimony, which tells me, yeah, that's, that's, that leans very heavy on historical fact, right? So he indeed was foreordained. By the way, that word might trigger you. What, you and I are locked in time. We're on this line. You know, there's, there's the beginning, there's the middle, and these, there's the end. And we have a life, right, that had a beginning. And we had parents like so many do. We had a beginning, we have a middle, and there will be an end to our physical life. Everybody has that. You start talking about God outside of time, that he'll always exist into eternity, but he has always existed. Like, I can, I can imagine what it is to always be, but to, rem to think about God having always been, how far can your brain go back to... Well, before that, well, no, no, further than that, <laughs> like eternity. And then you say that word and you're like, I don't know what that means. And as much as you stretch your brain, you just won't get it, right? And yet it says here that he indeed, meaning Christ, was foreordained before the foundation of the world. Jesus, before he was born, preexisted. Figure that one out. He was foreordained, by the way. Prognosco is the word, which means he was foreknown. Pro means before, and gnosko is a word for knowledge. We have the word knowledge. So it was before he was known. He was known before. So it's foreknowledge really should be um, instead of foreordained. You think ordained, you think, you know, somebody's going to get um, and, and appointed to a certain ministry or a certain thing. But he was foreknown beforehand to foresee and to foreknow. And yet he was revealed to us. It's interesting. Revelation 5, 6 gives us another look. And he says, I looked and behold, in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders saw a lamb as though it had been slain. You guys know who that is, right? That's Jesus. And it says later in Revelation 13, 8, all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. You know who that is? That's Jesus Christ. Before the world was set up and got rolling, Jesus was crucified for you. You see, God is without time. He's beyond time. He's not locked in time like you and I are. We have to march through this thing. And there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. And God is over and around all of it. So, any of you who like sci-fi and time travel and stuff, that may, that may be because that's, you're talking about God who's outside of time. Anyway, that's why I like sci-fi, because it points me back to him. Verse 22, since you have purified your souls, speaking to these believers, in obeying the truth through the spirit and sincere love for the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Well, that seems a little redundant, doesn't it? Since you guys have received this and you're born again and you love each other, you should love each other. I, I'm kind of doing that, Lord, you know, like... <laughs> He says, you should love each other fervently with a pure heart. By the way, those two words for love are two different words. The first one is phileo, which is a brotherly love. Since you guys have accepted Christ and you're practicing this brotherly love, you guys should agape. You guys should be unconditionally sacrificial towards one another. Now, that's a different level, isn't it? To be sacrificially giving up of yourself for someone else and considering them more important than yourself, like we looked at, that's another level, isn't it? I mean, it's easy to give when you have a surplus. It's hard to give when you don't have enough and you don't know how you're going to pay your bills, when you're not sure if you have enough money for food. If you don't know if you have a bill coming up and you don't have the money for it, then it's hard to give, isn't it? It's when you don't have and you really have to trust the Lord in that. That's hard. 
And yet he says here, now that you guys have purified your souls by obeying the truth through the spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another, agape, fervently. Fervently means with, uh, to the point of sweat, okay? You exercise energy and effort in this thing to love one another sacrificially. Wow, Pastor Dave, that sounds like a lot. Yeah, it is a lot. It sounds like it's really hard. Yeah, it's really hard. I'm starting to feel a little convicted that maybe I'm not doing that. Well, me too. Sacrificial. If your name was brought up in polite company, would they say, now there's a person who's sacrificial? Because if somebody is self-sacrificing and loving other people, it's very evident. I wonder about that. So now that I have come, I take this as an instruction to myself. Since I have purified my soul by obeying the truth through the spirit and sincere love for the brethren, I should agape all you people fervently with a pure heart, like not looking to be seen, not looking to get something back, not looking for the, the quid pro quo, you know, just, just giving out of an abundance that God gives to us. Imagine if we all did that. Imagine if we all did that. I'm, I'm glad to know that we really don't have any needs in this body that I'm aware of. Because as soon as that need pops up and it's known, it gets taken care of. In one way or another, either interpersonally or we go through the, the, you know, the, all of, the, all of the, the, the political structure of getting it done. But people get needs and they come up and they get taken care of. And I, I thank you people for that. I mean, we have, we have money in our bank account, guys. Praise God. It's because you guys are faithful to giving. And you're sacrificial and you're considering others more important than yourself. And we're trying to be faithful with what it is that you give and careful about not just giving it away, you know, just without any cause or without any mind. So I thank you for that. But loving one another fervently with a pure heart, boy, that's a, that is a goal that we should have, to be sacrificial. You know, like a dad would take arrows for his kid or jump in front of a bullet, you know, or a mom would do that. Because Jesus did that for us, didn't he? He gave everything for us. He's deserving of all from us. In 2 Corinthians 1, 3 to 6 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Did you catch that? Amen. Jersey. You're going through hard times. You're going through hard times that has nothing to do with you. It has to do with you experiencing that so you have compassion on other people that are going through the same thing as you. You know, I, I tend to have compassion on people that have gone through things that I've gone through. Like giving birth, I find it hard to have compassion because <laughs> I've never done that. But I've been there. And I've been accused of many things. Look what you did to me. I just, if you have been through something, like one mom talks to another and say, yeah, my baby was a tough delivery. I know. It's like picking up your upper lip and bringing it up over your head. Yes. I, I, you, you get people talking about stuff who have been through the same thing. You know what I'm talking about? That's why God lets us go through some of those things so that we have connection and we have compassion on other people. Otherwise, we wouldn't. I mean, how would you enter into an emotional relationship like that with somebody who's been through something that you haven't been through? You guys go to funerals, right, and somebody dies, and, and you go up to the person who is grieving, and what do you say? I'm sorry. Usually a bunch of stupid things, <laughs> right? Yeah. Most, of the, most of us don't have a pocket full of things that we know what to say. We haven't prepared this in advance. It's not like, wait. And you pull out the paper you've prepared and say, let me just, one minute. And Like, we don't do that. We just go and go, wow. 
it sucks to be you. <laughs> or you say, I'm sorry, like it's your fault. Or this is the best. They're in a better place. And you know they don't give a rip right now because they're hurting. They're there. Right? If you went through somebody close to you that died, you will know that none of that will ever stick. What will stick is for somebody to sit with you, to cry with you, to hug you, let them cry on your shoulder. That's going to mean so much more than anything you can say, any theological treatise you're about to throw at them, any scripture that you think is going to bring them comfort. God allows us to go through things so we can experience it, so we have compassion on other people. And we can show the love that God showed to us in that moment, we can show love to others. Make sense? So sometimes it's not about you at all. It's, you didn't do anything wrong. You're just suffering. You know what it's like to go out and your car is gone because someone stole it? Okay, well, I can't talk to you then. <laughs> no. I imagine that all the time, especially when I can't find my car and I don't know where I parked it. It's like, I was, I, I was parked right here. It's gone. And I don't know what that's like, but I've experienced it many times. <laughs> What we go through is on purpose. There's nothing accidental. And there's nothing that God can't use in our lives. From the death of a loved one or to losing a, a vehicle. God works through all of those things and gives us compassion. And gives us instruction and wisdom so that we can hand it off to other people. What robbery it is to have God do all this work in your life and for you not to hand off that torch. Because I'm sure that you've been through things that could help me. And I'm sure I've been through things that can help you. What sort of robbery is it to not share it? It's almost like the whole purpose of going through it, I'll have to do it over. Oh, no. Nobody wants to do things over. Purposeful suffering. We go through difficulties so that we might give comfort to others with the comfort that we received from the Lord. So I have a feeling today you will get a chance to exercise that. And he says in the end, because all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. That's Isaiah chapter 40. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. You see, life is very short and our lives are like grass and our glory, the things that we like, the things that are nice about our lives that we enjoy are like the flower of the grass, but everything dies. I mean, this is the last week of August. Then comes September, October, November. December, January, <laughs> and my wife has opposite feelings for me. I'm not looking forward to freezing cold weather and having to go outside and do anything. I'm grateful to put away the lawnmower, but I don't like zero degrees. It's like inhuman. She loves cold weather. I like hot weather. I don't mind sweating. I can always wash. <laughs> Freezing, you can't wash that off. It just makes you walk funny when you're overclothed. But you see, our life, the things we enjoy, fade and go away. Our health comes and goes. The things we enjoy, sometimes we don't enjoy. I think I lost some uh, taste because of COVID. And so those things that I once really, really, really enjoyed, I just kind of enjoy now. And everything kind of fades. All you have to do is go buy a new vehicle. <laughs> it's new, it's shiny, it's beautiful, it has that wonderful new car smell. And then you drive it off the lot, and you go shopping. 
<laughs> and you find your car has been impacted by shopping carts because of the world that we live in. New things were never designed to stay new. They never will. Relationships. Oh, I met a girl. Oh. How long have you been married? 40 years. <laughs> Listen, it's work. It's work to keep, to keep it good and to build deeper and deeper with a relationship. It takes work. It takes the death of you to make sure that it lasts because it's so easy to drift apart from people. You know that. It takes the death of you so that you can live like Christ to do what he calls us to do. In Philippians 2, 3 to 4, it says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in loneliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. I, if you guys remember the goofy gophers, um, the television was my babysitter as a child, so I have lots of things memorized. The goofy gophers were these, these two characters that were just so kind and so thoughtful of each other. You know, they would, they would do all these shenanigans, and then before they ran away or jumped in a hole or, or they did something, it was always... Oh, no, 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 after you, by all means. It's like, no, 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 please, you first. It's like, well, well, thank you very much. You know, they're sitting there having a conversation while, like, a cat is moving in on them, you know, to kill them. And, and they're going way out of their way to be kind to the other one. And I just thought it was just a, a really good picture of what it is to think more of the needs of others than to think of yourself. I think of these, you know, goofy gophers that were always doing that. Um, any of you remember those guys? You remember? Oh, okay, good. Do what they do. You know? Uh, it's like, oh, I hope he's finished because I'm going to jump in the car. I'm going to be the first one out of the parking lot. You missed the whole sermon. Well, I hope you guys are enjoying the book of Peter, and we're going to be back here next week. On the